Hello and welcome back to a short series on the basics of performing density functional theory calculations. This series will be based on the excellent textbook by David Scholl and Janice Teckel, and also in part from my own experience performing DFT calculations. This episode, focusing on the nuts and bolts of DFT, should give you some background on how DFT calculations are actually performed by your computer. Something that's important to keep in the back of your mind, whether you're performing DFT calculations on your own, or when you're evaluating the DFT calculations performed by others, is how well converged the results are. What does it mean for results to be converged? To answer this question, it's worthwhile to remember that the heart of density functional theory relies on finding the ground state electron density for a collection of atoms. Obtaining this density requires solving a complicated set of mathematical equations, and for a computer to actually solve these equations requires a number of numerical approximations to be made. For example, solutions that are formally expressed as infinite sums need to be truncated to finite sums. Another example is when evaluating integrals in multidimensional space the computer can only examine the integrand at a finite collection of points. In each numerical approximation, it's possible to get closer and closer to the exact solution by using more and more computational resources. This is the process that is referred to as convergence. A well-converged calculation is one where the numerically derived solution accurately approximates the true solution of the problem posed by DFT with a specific exchange correlation functional. It's important to note that the idea of numerical convergence is quite separate from whether or not a DFT calculation actually gives an accurate description of reality. You might remember from the first episode in this series that the exact solution of a DFT problem is unlikely to be identical to the exact solution of the Schrodinger equation, simply because the true form of the exchange correlation functional is not known. The issue of the physical accuracy of DFT, though important, is going to have to be a problem for another time. In this episode, the focus will be on what's required to perform well-converged DFT calculations. After all, we'll need to be able to confidently find precise solutions to the numerical problems defined by DFT before we can reasonably discuss the agreement between our calculations and reality. It turns out, it's often more convenient to solve many of the mathematical problems posed by DFT in terms of reciprocal space rather than in terms of real space. The reason for this is the consequence of Bloch's theorem. Bloch's theorem states that the solutions to the Schrodinger equation for systems that repeat periodically in space, such as metal crystals, are able to be expressed as a sum of terms of the following form, phi k is equal to e to the i k dot r times a function u k, where the function u k is periodic in space with the same periodicity as the system we're investigating. In the case of an FCC crystal, u of k is periodic in space with the same periodicity as a supercell. What Bloch's theorem tells us is that it's possible to try and solve the Schrodinger equation for each value of k independently. This also applies to quantities derived from solutions of the Schrodinger equation, such as the electron density. Functions that have the form e to the i k dot r, like you see here in Bloch's theorem, are called plane waves, and calculations that make use of them are often called plane wave calculations. The space of vectors r is called real space, and the space of vectors k is called reciprocal or simply k-space. But how do we get to k-space from real space? To answer this question, we need to start by examining the concept of a primitive cell. You might remember that a primitive cell is the most basic supercell that can describe an entire crystal. The primitive cell, for a face-centered cubic crystal, can be described by the vectors a1, a2, and a3 that you see here. And for convenience, the origin of the primitive cell is at the position 0, 0, 0. Once you know what the primitive cell is for your crystal, you can easily find the position of any atom inside the crystal by a linear combination of these three lattice vectors with integer coefficients. Just as positions in real space can be defined in terms of the lattice vectors, it's useful to define vectors that can be used to describe the positions in reciprocal space. These vectors are known as reciprocal lattice vectors. They're defined so that the dot product of a i and b j is equal to 2 pi if i is equal to j and 0 otherwise. This definition means that the reciprocal space vectors are related to the real space vectors by the following formulas. For instance, the reciprocal lattice vector b1 is obtained from 2 pi times the cross product of lattice vectors a2 and a3 divided by the dot product between the lattice vector a1 and the cross product of lattice vectors a2 and a3. Similarly, b2 is equal to 2 pi times the cross product of the lattice vectors a3 and a1 divided by the dot product between the lattice vector a2 with the cross product of lattice vectors a3 and a1. The reciprocal lattice vector, b3, likewise, is equal to 2 pi times the cross product of the lattice vectors a1 and a2 divided by the dot product between the lattice vector a3 and the cross product of the lattice vectors a1 and a2. 
Substituting in the lattice vectors of an FCC primitive cell into these formula give the FCC reciprocal lattice vectors. B1 is equal to 2 pi over a 1 1 minus 1. B2 is equal to 2 pi over a minus 1 1 1. And B3 is equal to 2 pi over a 1 minus 1 1. What should be clear from these formulas is the inverse relationship that exists between the lengths of the real space vectors and the reciprocal lattice vectors. This is the consequence that large distances in real space correspond to small distances in reciprocal space, and vice versa. At the right, you can see the reciprocal space basis vectors, shown inside a cube with side length 4 pi over a centered at the origin. The primitive cell in reciprocal space is called the Brillouin zone. You can see here plotted the reciprocal lattice vectors that define it. Important points within the Brillouin zone are given individual names. The most important of these points is the point where the vector k is equal to 0, at the origin of the Brillouin zone. This particular point is called the gamma point. But why is the Brillouin zone so important when it comes to plane wave DFT calculations? A simple answer is that the majority of the work for DFT calculations boils down to evaluating integrals of the following form. The key features of this integral are that it's defined in reciprocal space and it integrates over all possible values of k in the Brillouin zone. As evaluation of these integrals takes up so much of the computational effort of DFT calculations, Finding a process to efficiently evaluate these integrals has been a carefully studied problem. Before going further, it's worth remembering that an integral of a function can be thought to represent the area beneath the curve. You might remember from introductory calculus the concept of a Riemann sum, a very simple way to approximate the area beneath the curve. You can obtain the Riemann sum through adding together rectangles with heights equal to f of x and widths equal to delta x. With this method, an error arises due to proportions of the rectangles that are above or below the function, as you can clearly see here. If we want to improve the accuracy of this approximation, we can minimize the error by decreasing the width of the rectangles, though, as a consequence, this increases their number. At the limit of delta x goes to zero, or in other words, there are infinite rectangles of height f of x and width zero, this method will converge exactly to the integral. There are different methods for approximating the area beneath the curve that converge to the true value of the integral faster than using rectangles. Examples of such methods are the trapezoidal method, or, even faster, Legendre quadrature method. We now return to the integrals being solved by the computer during a DFT calculation. It's important to have an efficient, yet still, accurate way to numerically approximate these integrals. A widely used method to do this was developed by Monkhorst and Pack in the 1970s. They came up with a way of generating a grid of discrete points in k-space at which the integrals could be evaluated. This grid of k-points is termed the k-point mesh. To use their method, all you need to do is specify how many k-points will be used along each direction in reciprocal space. When specifying the number of k-points used to generate the k-points mesh, say with m k-points in each direction, this should be described as a calculation performed using m by m by m k-points. From our earlier discussion on numerical approximations, it should be obvious that the more k-points you use, meaning a denser k-point mesh, the better it converge your calculation will be. You can see the evidence for this in the plot of the total energies per atom of bulk FCC copper as a function of m for calculations performed using m by m by m k-points. The trade-off, however, is that the more k-points you use, the more costly your calculation becomes. The ideal number of k-points required to reach convergence is not something one can usually be certain of beforehand. It's therefore important that you determine the number of k-points required to reach convergence for each new system that you work with. Something you should take away from this discussion is what really matters when it comes to convergence is the density of the k-point mesh, as by increasing the number of k-points, what you're really doing is increasing the density of the k-point mesh. A good rule of thumb, as you perform and compare your own DFD calculations, is that calculations performed with a similar k-point density will also have a similar level of convergence. While we're on the topic of numerically approximating integrals, it's worth mentioning that these approximations converge rapidly to the exact result of the integral when the integrands are continuous functions. Unfortunately, this useful property isn't always available in the k-space integrals of DFT calculations. An especially important example of this is the case of metals. In a metal, the Brillouin zone can be divided into regions that are occupied and unoccupied by electrons. The surface in k-space that divides these two regions is called the Fermi surface. This is important when it comes to solving integrals in k-space, because the functions being integrated change discontinuously from non-zero values to zero at the Fermi surface. As a result, if no special action is taken, it would require sampling a very large number of k-points if you wanted to obtain well-converged results. As metals are a rather important subset of all materials, a number of algorithms have been developed to address this problem of slow convergence. The two best-known methods are the tetrahedron and smearing methods. In the tetrahedron method, 
The idea behind it is to use the discrete set of k-points to define a set of tetrahedra that fill reciprocal space. The function being integrated is then defined at every point inside the tetrahedron using some type of interpolation. At the simplest level, this could be a linear interpolation used within each tetrahedron. Once this interpolation has been performed, the function being integrated has a simple form at all positions in k-space, and the integral can be evaluated analytically using the entire space rather than just the original discrete points. One of the most widely used versions of the tetrahedron method was developed by Blochel, and includes interpolation that goes beyond linear interpolation. The smearing method, on the other hand, takes a different approach. The idea behind the smearing methods is to force the function being integrated to be continuous by smearing out the discontinuity. An example of a smearing function is the Fermi Dirac function you can see here, which, in the limit of sigma goes to zero, approaches a step function. This whole discussion of k points and k space started with Bloch's theorem which tells us the solutions of the Schrodinger equation for a periodic lattice have the form phi k is equal to e to the i k dot r times the function u k. The function u k has the same periodicity as the supercell. This periodicity means it can be expanded in terms of a special set of plane waves, where summation is over all vectors defined by g is equal to m1 b1 plus m2 b2 plus m3 b3 with any integer values for m i. The set of vectors defined by this formula in reciprocal space are defined so that for any real space lattice vector ai, g dotted into ai is equal to 2 pi mi. Combining these two equations gives the following formula. Something you should notice is that this formula means that evaluating these solutions even at a single point in k-space requires summation over an infinite number of possible values of g. It's clear that something has to be done in order to make these types of calculations feasible. Fortunately, the functions phi k have simple interpretations as solutions to the Schrodinger equation, with the kinetic energy E equal to h bar over 2m times the magnitude squared of the vector k plus the vector g. We can reasonably assume that solutions with lower energies are more physically important than solutions with higher energies, so we can truncate the infinite sum in phi k to only include solutions that have kinetic energies less than some value. This reduces phi k to a sum over values of the vectors k plus g less than some cutoff energy g cut. And you might notice, depending on the value of k, the summation will include slightly different numbers of terms. This discussion has introduced yet another parameter that must be defined whenever you perform a DFT calculation, the cutoff energy e cut. Given here is a plot of how the energy per atom for copper in an FCC lattice converges as the cutoff energy in the DFT calculations is increased. These calculations were performed for bulk FCC copper with a lattice constant of 3.64 angstroms and using 12 by 12 by 12 k points. As you can see, the choice of cutoff energy is an important parameter when it comes to performing well converged calculations. The choice of cutoff energy is usually fairly simple, as in most DFT packages, the calculation will run using sensible default values. Even still, it's important you report the cutoff energy you use in your calculations in order for others to be able to reproduce your results. It's useful to know that the default values for cutoff energies of each type of atom aren't going to be the same. Some elements will require higher or lower cutoff energies. For instance, in VASP, copper has a cutoff energy of 273.2 eV, while carbon has a cutoff energy of 400 eV. It's important that when you want to compare calculations involving these two compounds, that you use the same cutoff energy when you do the calculation. Otherwise, you'll introduce systematic errors into your results. Finally, we'll touch on a major method that must be employed to reduce the computational cost of DFT calculations. From a physical point of view, core electrons aren't that important when it comes to defining many of the interesting characteristics of materials, such as chemical bonds, ionization energies, and so on. A pseudopotential, in essence, replaces the costly calculations for the contributions of the core electrons to the electron density with a smooth density that matches the various important physical and mathematical properties of the true ion core. The properties of the core electrons remain fixed in this approximate fashion during a DFT calculation. This is called the frozen core approximation. There are different ways to construct pseudopotentials for DFT calculations. One of the most widely used methods of defining pseudopotentials is based on the work by Vanderbilt. These are known as the ultra-soft pseudopotentials, or the USPPs. A disadvantage of USPPs is that constructing the pseudopotential for each atom requires a number of empirical factors to be specified. Another frozen core approach that avoids some of the disadvantages of USPPs is the projector augmented wave, or PAW method, originally introduced by Blochel and adapted for plane wave calculations by Kress and Jobert. You can find the original references for Blochel, Kress, and Jobert's work here. 
These are the types of pseudopotentials that I've most often made use of when I perform my own DFT calculations. We can now try to figure out the minimum k-points and cutoff energies to achieve convergence for the systems you calculate. This is important information to know as it helps you to minimize the computational cost of your future DFT calculations. To help you out, I've included a simple bash script that you can incorporate into your VASP calculation submission file when you're preparing to perform these calculations. I've gone into detail elsewhere regarding how this type of script operates, so for now I'll just tell you the variables you might need to change are marked with colored text, with the particularly important variables highlighted with bold blue text. I've also done something similar for the cutoff energy, as you can see here. As before, the major changes to the script are highlighted with bold blue text. The major changes from the previous script are just the name and values within the array, and also how the stream editor updates the in-car file. With these two scripts, it should now be a simple task to find the k-points and cutoff energies that work best for your system. Hopefully with this overview, you have a bit of a better appreciation for the steps you need to take in order to help your calculations converge. And now, it's time for you to try playing with them.